Well, hi there, and welcome once again to our Bible studies in search of Christianity here at Bible Talk. Here being West Tawakini, Texas, outside of Dallas. So we're glad you can join us and we can be together and share in God's Word. Amen. So on behalf of Alice, who you know, and myself, who you probably know, and Mary Ellen, yeah. Alice's sister. We want to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah. We're continuing on in our look at the uh, Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. And we'll start in Matthew 5, 9 today. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. What a wonderful thing to be called. Peacemaker. A son of God. Well, well, peacemaker and a son of God. Uh, as I often want to do, I will start with a dictionary. Before we get to the Bible? Yeah. Because the dictionary definition of a peacemaker is either a person or a group or a nation who tries to make peace, especially by reconciling people who are in disagreement, who are quarreling, who are fighting, right? Okay. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for reconciliation. There is, well, my goodness gracious, what a time of war we live in, wars and rumors of wars. Mm -hmm. But there's a root war. There's a foundational war. There is, a, there is an alpha war that took place that all other war is based on. And that is, well, let me first of all read Matthew 12, 30, where Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. In other words, Jesus said, You're either for me or against me. Mm -hmm. All right? That root war was when man sinned. That's an aggressive act against God. Yes. Now, you may not see it that way, but indeed it is, all right? In Ephesians chapter 2, the entire chapter is the Apostle Paul dealing with the fact that we, all mankind, mm -hmm. were separated from God the Father by our sin and enemies of God. Now, you may not think of it that way, but that's exactly what it is. When Jesus came and through his atoning work reconciled us to him, he made us friends of God. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Remember, we did a baptism here in West oh, Tawakini yes, a number of years ago. That's right. That's and that was the theme song. Got the song to prove it. Yeah, yeah I am a friend of God. I am right? a friend of God, yeah. yeah because it true. says, Paul wrote to the church in Rome, and he said, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, by his atoning work on the cross, reconciled us made, brought peace between us and God. That's, that's the whole idea. Right. Okay? Because Paul said of Jesus that he himself is our peace there in that second chapter of Ephesians. Mm -hmm. So James later would write, and he said, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, from whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Peace comes from above. Yes. You have to understand that all good things come from above. This is why, I mean, we have a history of warfare through all, all, all mankind's history. Right? So I want to say this, because it should be our desire. That's what the Beatitudes are about, how we find and walk and live in the blessings of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Our great desire should be peacemakers. Yes. But you can't be a peacemaker until you become a peace taker. You can't give what you do not have. Right. You can't bring peace unless you have peace. Mm -hmm. And you will not have real peace unless you have received it. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give with you, give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Mm -hmm. So that's John 14, 27. So if you, don't have, if you haven't received that peace from Jesus, you want to know something? You don't have peace to give. That's mm -hmm. right. Now I, me, I am a child of war. Mm -hmm. I'm a war baby. Yes. I was born in 1943. Mm 
get your calculators out. I was born in 1943 during the Second World War. Then later, in my Catholic grammar school, mm -hmm. right, in the early 50s, we would go every single day and pray for all of the soldiers who were fighting in Korea. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. When a ceasefire was declared, not a peace, there's never been a peace between America and North Korea, but a ceasefire was signed. I went through the balance of my grammar and high school days listening to the regular testing of the air raid sirens and ducking under my magic wooden <laughs> desk in the Catholic school, which was able to protect me from the yes, incoming sir. nukes. I remember that. Dive under the wooden desk. I remember the hallways, going in the hallways. Yeah, but every Friday at noon they would test the, the, the air raid sirens. I went into the U.S. Navy to fly uh, as, as an air crewman in patrol planes just as the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. Mm -hmm. uh, just before, I, I was just in when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened, and we were that far from nuclear war with Russia. That's right. I was flying patrols around the North Atlantic watching for intercontinental ballistic missiles coming in from Russia when I heard the flash reports that open hostilities were underway in North Vietnam. The Gulf of Tonkin, that's mm -hmm. right. Alice and I got married mm -hmm. in, the, in the 60s, late 60s, 1967 to be mm -hmm. precise. Mm -hmm. At a time, now uh, I'm, many of you may not remember this at all, but that was a time when we in America were a nation at war with itself. You would turn on the news every evening and you would watch as Newark, Harlem, Detroit, Baltimore, Watts in Los Angeles, they would show pictures of, of smoke rising from these cities. Clouds of black smoke hanging over these cities. Mm -hmm. Cities whose streets were filled with American soldiers to control American citizens. Mm -hmm. Okay? Today, I live, you live, in a world that is completely dominated by the wars and rumors of wars. Everywhere you look, That's right. all, over the world. all over the world. But I want to tell you something. I mean, you can look and you can see war in Syria. You can look and you can see war in Iraq. You can look and you can see war in Afghanistan. You can look, but mm -hmm. war resides in the heart. That's right. It only manifests in the flesh. Okay? It's a manifestation of something in the heart. There is either pre peace or there is war. It's always one or the other. That's right. And it rarely, if ever, has been peace. There has rarely, if ever, been a time, truly a time of peace on this earth. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the war is cold, but it's still war. Mm -hmm. It's not peace if it's a temporary ceasefire. What passes for peace in the world generally is just one or both of the sides taking a break to rearm or reload their bullets, saying, okay, don't be deceived. To exemplify our poor understanding of peace, one doesn't have to look farther than our own White House. Now, now, I'm not trying to be controversial or anything, but the very fact that the Nobel Committee awarded the 2009 Peace Prize to President Barack Obama when he was in the office less than two weeks, and you know, it, it indicates that there's something wrong, yes. there's something amiss, okay? Uh, what, what followed was it was generally agreed that he had been given the peace prize what they thought he might do in the future. Yeah. Well, and I'm not, I'm not trying to lay this on President Barack Obama, but if you go back to 2009 and look at where we are today in 2016. Are they still waiting to find out what he's done? Well, like I said, I don't want to claim it all on him by any means. But they ought to be giving an unpeace prize, you know, kind of an Alice in Wonderland kind mm -hmm. of deal, the unpeace. The first and worst war took place, as I said, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Mm -hmm. It was an act of aggression against the Lord. David, a man after God's own heart, right? Mm -hmm. He had an understanding of this principle when he prayed. In Psalm 51, David said, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Mm -hmm. Right? Our sin is an act of aggression against God. No sin goes unpunished. This is a fact. God is just. He cannot break his own word. No sin goes unpunished. And the wages of sin is death. What is merciful about God is not that the sin goes unpunished, 
but that his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, chose to bear the punishment for our sins, mm -hmm. and he died on the cross in our place. That's what other religions don't have, is that mercy. I mean, some, some religions call their God, you know, so-and-so the merciful, but the fact is I don't see mercy there. The mercy of God is balanced with the justice of God in as much as when a sin is punished, Jesus steps in to take our place. If you will receive that. Otherwise, I'm telling you, if you don't accept that great gift, then you're going to pay the price for your own sin. It's that Some simple. The consequence. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, that was followed by Cain when he rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And all mankind's been battling ever since. Mm -hmm. You got, you know, we think we live in a time of war. To the best of my knowledge, and I mean, it could be a little variation here. There were four people on Earth, yeah, right. <laughs> and twenty-five percent of them are at war with each other. That's right. Yeah. Okay. The Bible teaches, and history demonstrates, that the only way real and lasting peace will exist is when one of the parties is victorious. Because the other party is either annihilated or they surrender completely, totally, and unconditionally. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it goes on. Do, do you buy that? Yeah. Okay. How do we come to be at peace with God? Well, in that same Psalm, Psalm 51, David said, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. We Christians come to peace with God. When we surrender all, it's not just a hymn, it's not just a song, yeah. when we surrender all to him and then die. Because Jesus said, he was saying to everybody, right? He said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Mm -hmm. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one that will save it. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 9. And Paul said, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3.3. 3. Total surrender and death. That's the paradox, mm -hmm. because that's what leads to peace and life. That's the way that you can have new life. That's why Jesus said, don't be amazed. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. John 3.7. That old you, that sinful you, has to die. Amen. It's total surrender. <coughs> War is the natural state of man. Mm -hmm. Don't you no, know, we seem that we're surprised when there's war around it. It's a natural state of man. Mm -hmm. Now it's not the it's not the spiritual state of man. It's not the supernatural state of man. It's man's human nature. Mm -hmm. The first thing to know about war is that we've been saved and by and we serve the Prince of Peace. I've seen an awful lot, of, as we've traveled around, here, there, and everywhere, hither, thither, and yon, I've seen a lot of bad teaching on spiritual warfare. Mm. It's like, okay, put them up where you're ready, okay? Well, you put them up and you're ready, but remember that your warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, right? Jesus is the Prince of Peace. We are given a ministry of reconciliation. We have been, we being the sons of God, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. The sons of God have been given that ministry of reconciliation, filled with the love of God, filled with the word of God, and given the power of God to go out and make peace, to bring that word of reconciliation to anybody. And I am so troubled in this day that we live in, this day surrounded by war, that I see Christians so violently hating their enemies. And, and by listening, I'm not saying that what the enemies are doing, and you can point to any enemy you choose. Right. I'm not saying that they're right in doing it, or that it's good that they're doing it, mm -hmm. but I am telling you that here in the Sermon on the Mount, the sermon that tells us how we are to live righteously, Jesus said we're supposed to love our enemies. Pray we're supposed enemies. to pray for our enemies. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, okay, we'll just let them do whatever they want, because God has given the government they have given, he's given them the sword that they might protect us from evildoers. Right. If they do that or don't do it, you know, that's, but that's their responsibility. 
Our responsibility is to act as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, ambassadors for the kingdom of God, bringing that word of reconciliation. I have sat here in the few minutes that we've been together already Mm -hmm. and quoted a few times the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. How many men have ever lived that have been used so gloriously or so much for the glory of God the Father? I'm telling you, and you may, don't forget, there is a man who is an enemy of God. There is a man who was an enemy of the church. That's right. That's right. Even as God, he, even as he encountered the risen Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he was on his way to persecute and, and hopefully kill Christians. Mm. And yet God had chosen him as a vessel. Do you think that there's somebody in ISIS that God can't correct, change, and Absolutely. bring? To, yeah. yes. Nothing is impossible with God. That's right. So we're not, supposed to be praying, we're not supposed to be praying against them. We're supposed to be praying for them. That they will have a road to Damascus experience and meet the Prince of Peace. Because they have been deceived. They have been fooled by that liar, that one who is a liar by nature and the father of lies. Where is our compassion? Where is our love? Where is, it, where is our memory of the fact that Jesus Christ hung on a cross and said, Father, forgive them. And he was pointing to you. He was pointing to me. He was pointing to everybody who's ever lived. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever will. Amen. Our job is not to bring death to them. Our job is to bring life to them. Yes. Reconciliation. Because our war is not against them. Yeah. Our war is not against flesh and blood. Our war is against principalities. Our war is against that yeah. devil. And by the way, you might want to write this one down. Mm-hmm. He's already been defeated. Yeah. Hallelujah. Right. Yeah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> That's why it says in Hebrews, pursue peace with quite a few men. No. All men. Pursue peace with the people you like. Pursue people. Pursue peace with the people that think like you. Per, no. It says pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. This is what we've got to be doing. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Paul wrote to, to, to his son in the faith, Timothy, and he said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he said that all scripture is God breathed and profitable. It's profitable for correction. It's profitable for training in righteousness. Mm -hmm. This is the training in righteousness. When Jesus had... Jesus... It's time. Hallelujah. This man... That's your warning to be praying for your enemies. Amen. It is time. Time is running out. It is time. It's, you know, we, we need to be in that place. We're being trained in righteousness. Righteousness is the imitation of Jesus Christ. The Sermon on the Mount is about understanding the teaching of Jesus. This is what he expects in our life. Over and over he said, you've heard it said, but I say to you. Religion has been teaching something that misses the mark. For a long, long time. But the Spirit of God who is sent to lead us into all truth is teaching us this. That you and I, believers, sons of God, people filled with the Spirit of God, that our ministry is to be bringing a message of peace. Peace with God. Peace with God. You know, this world is going to pass away. That's what it says. This present world is... Talk about global warming. This present world is reserved for destruction by fire, the Apostle Peter says. That's global warming. And our desire is not to save a city here or a city there. Our desire, us, is to see men and women and children come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ that will take them in peace through all eternity. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Are you a Bible-believing Christian? My dear sister-in-law, are you a Bible-believing Christian? Hallelujah. And my dear wifey, are you a Bible-believing Christian? How about this one? You believe this one? Never, never pay back evil to, for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Yes, as much as possible. As much as possible. But we are not to repay evil for evil. It says if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If your enemy is thirsty, give him a drink. Okay? 
the, the key there, of course, is, as Alex has points out, it depends on you. It's not in your power to control the actions of others. You can be at peace with others. That doesn't mean that they're going to be at peace with you. It was the fear of war that led the Pharaoh of Egypt to harshly mistreat the Jews in the days just before the birth of Moses. That's what it says in Exodus. He was afraid that they would not grow in numbers. He, he was afraid of war. The Lord led his people out of Egypt the long way. Right? That's right. Yeah. Through the Red Sea in order that they might not see war. God is a God of peace. What is the source of war? Well, I'll read this to you. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that weigh war on your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. <laughs> you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's James chapter 4, 1 through 4. Listen, there is a way of peace. I, you know, I've, I've talked about Paul. I just want to share one other thing about the Apostle Paul. You know, it says that one plants another water, but it's God who gives the growth. Right? I know that I came to salvation because of things that God used people to plant in my life long before I, the day I got saved. Mm -hmm. and, and from some of the strangest places. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, was, I, I went to the opening showing in New York City of the movie Ben-Hur with Charlton Heston. Mm -hmm. And this may sound silly, because I was a Catholic, I knew nothing about the gospel. I knew nothing about Jesus Christ. I had absolutely no relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But I saw that movie, and I saw a scene when Jesus, and you only ever saw the back of him, bends down to help Ben-Hur when he's being taken as a slave mm -hmm. to the galleys to die. Yes. Mm -hmm. And a Roman soldier, Roman soldiers are tough dudes. Mm -hmm. That's no, that's no. <laughs> and this Roman soldier comes over and there's Jesus kneeling down by Ben-Hur who's flat on his face. Mm -hmm. And the soldier says, get away from him, I told you. And Jesus looks at him, looks him in the face. And this man's countenance just changes, and he backs up, and backs up, and backs up. There is such power in the face of God, and it is the power of love. That's right. And then years later, when I was a teenager, when I was 17 years old, and I grew up in New York City, at the time I liked rock and roll music, mm -hmm. the, the rock and roll of the day, doo -wop. Yeah. <laughs> and a friend of mine said, you need to come to my house and hear this record I got. It was really neat. And I went over it, and he had a cowboy record. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're here in Dallas, folks. Uh, yeah. it, was called, it was Marty Robbins, and it was called The Gunfighter's Balance. Yeah. Now, who in the world would expect to hear the gospel in The Gunfighter's gun Balance? Balance. Mm -hmm. He played a song, and the song was called The Master's Call. Mm -hmm. I ran out of his house. I felt like somebody had grabbed my heart. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what was going on, but something grabbed my heart. Those words that I heard from the movie, from the song, would years later bear fruit when Jesus got me on my birthday and said, I'm real, and I know exactly what's in your heart. Stephen, Stephen was a man of God, preached one of the greatest sermons of the history of the people of God you'll ever see in Acts chapter 7. Mm -hmm. And for that sermon, his reward was that the religious people took him out into the field to stone him to death. Mm -hmm. And as they stoned him to death, he looked up into the heavens and saw the glory of God and his face radiated with the glory of God as he was being murdered for preaching the gospel. And it says that there was a young man there who was holding the coats so people could throw the stones ever harder. Mm -hmm. And he heard what Stephen said that day, Father, do not hold this sin against them. That young man was Saul of Tarsus. That young man died on the road to Damascus. Yes. And Saul died. And Paul the Apostle, a bondservant of the Most High God, came to life. 
You don't know what a word can do spoken in right season to an enemy of yours. Bringing the love of Jesus Christ. Bringing the word of God. If it were not for Jesus hanging on that Christ cross and saying, Father, forgive them, you and I would have no hope whatsoever. That is the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. The cross is a parable, by the way. It is the greatest story ever told. That's why Paul would come to say, I have decided to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. Mm -hmm. But if you can picture a cross, okay, and there's a, there is obviously the wooden, the wooden piece that stands mm -hmm. from the ground up. Right. It links the earth to the heavens. Mm -hmm. That upright mm -hmm. is about your relationship with God. And the cross piece, mm -hmm. this is like us here. Mm -hmm. The cross piece is man's relationship with man. Yes. Mm -hmm. But take away that vertical piece that's holding that, and what happens to that other relationship? It collapses. If you don't have a right relationship with God, you will never have a right relationship with any man. Mm -hmm. That's true for you husbands. You'll never have a right relationship with your wife unless you have a right relationship with God. Mm -hmm. That's true for you, wifey. You'll never have a right relationship with your husband if you don't have a right relationship with God. Without that, you'll never have peace. Without the peace of God in your life, mm -hmm. in your heart, mm -hmm. in your heart, your mind, and your mouth, you will never have a right relationship with anybody on this planet. Without the relationship, the right relationship between God and man, the horizontal relationship between man and man will always collapse and fall to the ground. He is our peace. No Jesus, no peace. He is peace. All right. We, we, time. Hear the tick tick? Time is flying through. The Bible teaches and history demonstrates that enmity between man cannot be replaced by any real peace until those men have made their own peace with God. Mm -hmm. Period. And although warfare may ebb and flow, I mean, you know, sometimes it looks worse, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It'll continue on and on and on. And it's going to continue on and on and on until the Great War. And the Great War, you know, it, I'm, I'm running out of time. Mm -hmm. You're running out of time. We're all running out of time. Yes, because I want to tell you, these are the perilous last days. Mm -hmm. And this time is coming to an end. Years ago, I was praying, and it was like I had this vision. And it, I, I couldn't see the face of Jesus, but it was like I could feel myself in the presence before the throne of God and the angels and the saints who have gone on before us. And there was a stillness, and all of a sudden, I heard the Father say to his son, Jesus Christ, It's time. Get the horse. <laughs> <laughs> and a shudder ran through heaven. Well, you know what? The time is coming yes. when God the Father is going to say to Jesus, it's time. Because even Jesus said he doesn't know the time. But the time is here. Be reconciled to God that you might be reconciled to with, with men. Okay? But more, most importantly is that God offers you his hand in friendship. He offered you his son. Yes. that you might have peace. Oh. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for that amazing gift, a gift that we truly can't begin to comprehend. We can only just get a glimpse at the power of your love. But we thank you for the love so great that you sent your only begotten Son to die in our place, that mercy might be poured out and justice might be done. We thank you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Well, until next time, God bless you and goodbye.